What is happening, everybody? Welcome into a brand new episode of Crossed Up. I am Bob Wankel. Anthony Sanfilippo is here. And listen, Anthony is down in Nashville right now, so he's without his typical recording gear. So we were like, do we want to do this? Are we doing this today or what? But in light of what has transpired, we have to. We have to. Yes. So we will forge ahead and try to sort through what has been just a train wreck, a train wreck of a 2023 season, and especially a train wreck of the last four games. Just a complete disaster, Anthony. So I'll bring you in. I don't know if you have any opening comments, any opening statements for what the hell is going on with this team right now. I wish I had an answer for you, Bob. They're, they're in a, a pretty dark place right now. Um, and that's that's what the concern is because we, we know that they're – like, look, we know that they're resilient, right? We know the things that they keep saying are true about the people and the makeup of the clubhouse and the, and the people that are in there. They're not lying to you. This is not a team that's – that's just mailing it in. They don't. It's not like they don't care, even though it looks like it, right? It, it, it's not the case. But they're in a spot where they don't have answers themselves for what is going on, and it's like there is a total book out on the Phillies right now, both from a, you know, hitting against their pitching perspective, but more so pitching against that lineup. I mean, it's every game the same thing. It's not like it's a it's a dirty secret. You, we can we can look at it and see what the book is on how to pitch against the Phillies right now and do so successfully. And they can't figure it out. And I it, it's amazing to me because I know they see it, right? I know that they see what's wrong, and yet they can't figure it out. So that's what's that's what's so amazingly alarming of this whole thing and why it's why to me they're in a dark place look we we've talked about this in the past and pitching is always going to be a concern you, you can't win without good pitching we know that right and we're going to, we're going to get into all the warts of this team at this point but the, the problem with this team right now is a hundred percent primarily the line sure. I mean, really i mean if you get this lineup towards where it needs to be. Yeah, we'll still have stuff to bitch about about pitching, but you're not six games under 500, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're sitting there saying, okay, this is a decent team and we need to upgrade the pitching to make it a real contender, right, to be a 10 for that World Series. But right now, if you can't get the – if you, your lineup can't do anything and three runs in three games against the Mets, holy hell – like, then it doesn't matter what your pitching is at all. Well, in some ways, in some ways, I, I kind of long for the days of, of 2020, 2021, where you had a good offense or at least a, an offense that, that showed in spurts that it could be dominant at times. I mean, they were inconsistent for a number of years. But you said, look at these pieces. You know they're going to get going. And then it would be the bullpen crumbling three nights a week. But you always felt like, well, okay, at least – at least we can go out and maybe address this issue with uh, with a reliever or two. And, and they, they weren't able to do that up until last year. They were never really able to build that bullpen. But you as a fan could at least consume this and say, man, if they could just get somebody to pitch the ninth inning or if they could just get another piece to handle high leverage spots, like maybe that'll push them over the top. When you look at this team and its struggles, not only is it boring as hell to watch because they can't score, it's infuriating to watch them flail away. It pitches out of the strike zone, not cashing with runners in scoring position. But you're also talking about a series of players that have established track records, which makes it even more mystifying. But on top of that, there's this sense of, well, what are you going to do? Because many of these players are very highly paid and they're here for multiple years. And it's not just as easy as saying like, well, let's go out and, and add a reliever. You, you can't go out and replace the catcher. You can't go out and replace the shortstop. You, you cannot do it. So you're, you're sort of married and constricted to what you currently have in front of you. This isn't like, well, make a tweak or two, make an addition or two, and it's all good. It's like, 
it's like a epidemic. It's like a, it's across the board. And I just don't know how, how easy it is to solve and overcome that other than you just simply hope that these are good players. They all happen to be going through something that is just absolutely uh, baffling altogether at the same time and that they will inevitably come out of it. But as, as each series passes, as each game passes, like we called the episode on Monday or Tuesday when we recorded checkpoint, we were like, yo, it's time now for this Phillies team to really show that after 50 plus games of, of kind of just dicking around that, Hey, it's, it's time to kind of go here a little bit. And then what do they do? They go out and they just play three dreadful, no energy, lackluster, like almost heartless. Like, and and I want to talk about the complacency thing and the lack of urgency thing. Let's like, can we dive into that? Because I will say this, when you watch a team fail to score runs, it doesn't look like they have energy. It doesn't look like they care because you know, there's nothing going on. There's no, there's no chaos on the bases. There's no, there's no action going on. It's just bad at bat, back to the dugout, bad at bat, back to the dugout. Maybe you, you spark a rally once or twice in these games and then it's thwarted. So it's easy to say that a team doesn't have energy or focus or urgency when they're not hitting. But at the same time, like there has to be something that, that describes what's going on here. There has to be some explanation for this. It, it, it's, it's not happenstance. Bob, that's the thing. Like, it's really, it's, it's hard. Is there an explanation? Probably, right? I mean, but we, all we could do is, is say, well, we look at the numbers and we see what the, where the problems lie, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's an explanation as to why that's happening, right? Because the, like you said, these are people or players who've historically been very good at their jobs. I mean, there's nobody you sit there and go, oh yeah, well that guy overperformed last year and now he's getting, now he's falling back to reality. Not, not one. Like every player who is struggling mightily for the Phillies is struggling to compare to their, to their historical career, like career numbers. I mean, that's just what it is. I, so uh, might there be explanations as to what they're doing wrong? Of course. But as to how, why it's happening and how to fix it, <laughs> I, I, like I think, I think we're at a point where it's just like it just has to happen because you're a professional ball player that you have to figure it out. I mean, other than that, if there's nothing that you or I or anybody else can really say to say, well, if they just do this, it'll be fine. But like there is, there's nothing. That's, that's, that's what's so damning and so frustrating. One of the early messages from that coaching staff, from Rob Thompson, he's talked about it numerous times, is we address complacency in spring training. We talked about how it'll be, it, it could be easy to it's sort of let this thing get off to a slow start. It's, it's easy to kind of rest on what happened last year. It's easy to take comfort in getting off to a slow start and then turning things on. And they swear up and down every player, every coach, that that is not what happened. I would tell you this. The fact that it had to be addressed, the fact that it was brought up at the beginning of spring training, lets you know that it's a real thing. It's not something that fans and media types sort of just cook up as a storyline. Like, when you have players in there saying, we can't let this happen, when you have a coaching staff in there saying, like, we cannot let this happen, it's because they know it's real. And you can even try, I think. I think you can make a concerted effort to not let that lack of urgency, to let that complacency sit or settle in. But at the same time, I think that every single one of those guys, when, when April was up and down and sort of mediocre, there's a difference between not panicking and also saying like, well, look at what happened last year. And I think, I really do, just based on the results that, to some degree, whether or not it was conscious, whether it was intentional, there was some type of complacency, some type of over-reliance on a slow start last year being overcome. Now, I think that they know. Like, I, I don't think that there's any complacency in there now. I think they're sitting there looking at it. We're one game ahead of the last place, Washington Nationals. We are – we have the seventh worst run differential in baseball. We have – the seventh lowest amount or fewest runs uh, scored per game right now. I mean, like they know. They know this has been horrible. It's been embarrassing. And now I wonder, 
if it's going the opposite direction where it's not a lack of urgency, but it's almost like, oh, shit. And now they're overcompensating for it. And it just kind of has the same effect. It's the same. The net result is the same. It looks unfocused. It looks sloppy. It looks bad. And I, I do wonder if that is what has happened here. Yeah, I, I do think I think that's a that's a valid um, perspective that you have because I do feel like maybe they they were smelling themselves a little bit early, and then they got punched in the mouth a few times, and then they went on a few winning streaks, and it was like, see, we could do this. We're, yeah. this, we're the Phillies. We could come back. We can, you know, no worries. We could do our thing, and then maybe they then settled back into a little bit of lack of urgency for a little while. And then, you know, you have a couple of losing streaks and that's, that was that period where it was like win four in a row, lose five in a row, win four or five in a row, lose six in a row, like whatever. And, and that was just, just a wild stretch of games where like you, you never see it be that extreme. And then they hit another cold snap here and they can't figure this out. And I think that they're realizing it because they're now facing their, the, you know, the teams they're competing with in their division and struggling, and struggling mightily. And look, they won two games against the Braves, and that's great. Um, but if one of them was a re- required a the best pitching performance of the season right, from Zach Wheeler in order to win that game. Because at the plate, they were not great. They only scored two runs. They struggled. They left runners in scoring position. So really, you only look at it and say, of the last seven games against the Braves and Mets, they had one game where you went, okay, they played good baseball. You know, I mean, as a team, full team Um, and the other six, again, great, one great pitching performance and five really not good. So that I think is where the, the, it is a realization that this isn't the same kind of group that can just turn it on at any point. Like we got on those runs because we did the right things, not because we can just turn it on. And I think that that's what, and I think that that's what you're trying to say, right? So do you think, I feel like we're talking about, I feel like we're about to perform an, an autopsy here, but with, with, the, <laughs> with the acknowledgement that they're not dead, this is not over. Uh, I've had people send me DMs lately and they're like, can't wait for your, I can't wait for your show tomorrow. Are you guys still going to tell us that they're a wild card team? And I'm like, I'm like, okay, man, I'm just telling you what I think. I still think they're a wild card team. How about that? I still think so that do, they're actually going to make so, the playoffs. So do I. Um, they have work to do. I get it. And I, I mean, listen, you and I text each other. I mean, you see some of these text messages I send you. I'm like, yes. I, I think it's very, very bad. <laughs> you know, I think that that's putting it nicely. Um, so yeah, I, we should actually start up a subscription service where, where people can, can come in and, and read the text exchange from, from between <laughs> us. It's really, I think it's really me to you that would people would would find interesting but um i mean look at this and and i don't i don't want to dig too much into this i don't want to like go crazy with the numbers because i think at the end of the day we all see the same thing we see a team that cannot hit we see a team that is erratic at best in terms of its starting pitching and it's a team where you don't really know where are you drawing your sources of of positivity from right now where are you drawing that inspiration to say like They'll be all right, other than track record. Let me just give you well, – well, go I'll, ahead. I'll, t- I'll tell you the, the, the very simple answer. The w- reason I look at it and say I still think – I still believe that this team is a playoff team is the National League is mediocre. Right. So you're not I – mean, it's not really anything that, to say about the Phillies. It's, it's to say right. that I mean, they, look, they, they I can mean, get let's, there. Let's be honest. I mean, they just got swept by the Mets. Did the Mets impress you at all? No, but I'm not going <laughs> to sit here and rag on the Mets this morning after no, they. No, but I'm just saying, goal. like, but, but that's what I'm saying. Like, the Phillies just got swept by a team who just there was nothing impressive about them. I mean, that's that's a, a major indictment on the Phillies by all yeah. stretching. I'm not trying to rip the Mets in that regard, but what I'm saying is that's who you're competing with for a playoff spot. Right. And that's not that great a team. And you know the Marlins and the and the Di- well the Diamondbacks are gone, but they have no pitching. Like, yeah, I mean, if you want me to be petty, like if you want me to be a little bit petty about what I saw with the Mets this week, like uh, I didn't think Ranger Suarez actually threw the ball that well the other night. Uh, no, I thought he didn't. that 
it was more of a product <laughs> of the Mets having poor at bats. And I, I think it's important the Ranger Suarez got a positive result. And I still think he'll be okay and, and all of those things. But I did not love what I saw from Ranger Suarez the other night. The Mets just had horrendous at bats. Then they took advantage of Aaron Nola. Uh, getting out of the strike zone at inopportune times, and, and Mark Kana runs into a couple balls. That was that game. And then they took advantage of Taiwan Walker's dead arm or whatever the hell is going on there, which I want to talk about in a little bit. And, I mean, there were no outbursts. There were no sensational the, – the thing that was amazing to me, we talked about it earlier this week, Mets bullpen is not particularly good. There's nobody that runs out of there that truly scares you at this point. The Phillies weren't able to do anything against that bullpen. Um, I, I really did feel like watching that. Yeah, sure. I think it was more of a product of Phillies playing especially poor baseball than anything exceptional that the Mets did. But at the same time, you know, Mets look up this morning. They're sitting there. They're on a little bit of a run right now. They have to feel pretty good about where they're at. I mean, where, where, where you're at with the Phillies, it's almost like that's what I want them to do. You don't have to even impress me. You don't even have to play your best baseball. But just find a way to gut it out occasionally. Right. And, they're, and they're not doing that enough. You know, the, the, when's the last time you say, oh, the team really gutted it out? Well, they split in Atlanta. That's that's fine. And you go back to what? Last Wednesday against the Diamondbacks are down 5 nothing, and we're supposed to applaud that after they lose the first two games of the series? Like, I'm tired of doing that. I'm, I'm tired of, of taking a team with a massive payroll, veteran laden, former all stars, big expectations, and saying, "Oh yeah, well, at least they didn't get swept." Like I'm over that. So you yeah, know, well, how about the Phillies gut it out and find a way to win a series or, or and, sweep a series? And I want to give you credit for this, even though I looked it up. But this was this was you asking the question, and so it was certainly your observation. Um, and then I looked up the data and, and to to back it up. You had asked me in one of those wonderful text exchanges, when was the last time the Phillies bullpen actually blew a lead late in the game? Like we're given a lead after the, in going into the seventh inning and, and, and coughed it up. And they've done it only three times all year. Or I'm sorry. Yeah, three times all year. They're 12 and three. But that's, that's what's the, the number that should, should stick out to you is that the Phillies have played 56 games. And of the 56, only 15 times have they given their – have they been in a game where they've had a lead of one to three runs going into the seventh inning and asked the bullpen to protect it. And, mm -hmm. and they, they did 12 out of the 15 times. The other 41 games, they've either been blown out, they've blown somebody out, and there have only been a few of those, or the game's been tied. Right. Right. So they're not even like there's not a lot of competitive games, even where you're where they're where they're ahead. There's enough. There have been many where they've been behind by a run, two runs late in the game, and they're trying to come back. Plenty of those, right? But there's none that are. Hey, the Phillies got off to a good start here. And yeah, I mean, generally speaking, if you're talking about a team that's going to be six games under 500, a team that's gone through these prolonged losing stretches, you would say, well, mixed in, there has to be a bunch of games where they've had late leads and they haven't protected them. I mean, that's the thing that's amazing. That's why I asked you the question, you know, when was the last time this happened? Because that's not what's happening at all. It is very rare that they take a, a small lead into the later innings. Like, that's just not – that's not been their game this year. So you want to, like – you want to say – what what is it that I'm I feel good about it I, I think from and I know that there have been blow-ups I know that Soto's had his moments late in games where he's not gotten it done there's been some issues with Sir Anthony Dominguez at times um Alvarado's obviously on the IL right now Kimbrel for the most part here recently has gotten it done but you have to hold your breath occasionally with him it's not a perfect bullpen but I still kind of gravitate towards that as the reason to to feel somewhat somewhat optimistic about a turnaround because if they can just get a little bit more offense, just a little bit, they're, they're likely to hold and protect those leads late. I, I still believe in their ability to do that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you look at the three, I, mean, I can pull off the top of my head, the three games where they didn't, it was the crazy game at the end of the Dodgers series that they lose on the uh, walk-off grand slam by Max Muncy. That was the game, game was a wild game, but they actually had a lead, blew it came back and tied it and then gave up the four runs in the, uh, in the bottom of the ninth. And then the other two were like within days of each other. It was 
uh, the the fi- the finale of the Red series, Red, the, o- o- the opening weekend. That was right. It was Easter yeah. Sunday. They blow that game, and then a couple days later, the bullpen blew one against the Marlins. Yeah. But that's it. Like every other time, they've been given a you know an opportunity to protect a close game late in the game. They've done it. Yeah, Soto had to blow up against the Braves, but it was five to five, right? I mean, that game was tied at that point. They didn't have a lead. Of course, tie game. You shouldn't just dismiss them. Like, no, games, I mean, just, listen, tie yeah, games yeah. are games you can win, and the bullpen right. did not contribute. And yeah, sure, it's fair. Yeah, but I'm just saying. I mean, the, the point that you, I think that you were asking is, is that they, you know, you're saying they don't give their bullpen a chance to win games for them. Right. They really don't. They, they, the only time you sit there and go, oh wow, we noticed the bullpen is because they've had to pitch five, six innings and keep them in a game that maybe the Phillies have come back and won, right? That's when you sit there and say, wow, the bullpen did a nice job today. You know, <laughs> it's a, they've kept them in games, but they have not been asked to lock down a game that the, that the offense gave them a lead. And that's, that's, that's frightening, really, that, that that happened so infrequently. So there's a lot of different ways that you could look at what has happened with this team offensively, especially against the Mets. In the opener, they don't have a runner each scoring position. So for all the talk about their struggles with runners in scoring position, they couldn't even manage to get a player to second base in the opener. Um, they really they, they had some opportunities at different points in yesterday's game uh, on Wednesday night, and they, they failed to do it. Um, I don't know how much I really want to go in and, and rehash each individual example and each individual failure. I don't, I think it's kind of uh, futile at this point. I don't think that there's really much of a reason to do it, but I, I will say this. Now you just look at their numbers overall and I just, I cannot get over this. Like if you would have told me almost 60 games in that they would be 24th and run scored. I would have said that's impossible. They're scoring 3.75 runs per game on the road this season. That that's almost impossible. You look at their road record. I believe they're 11 and 21 now. I think they're 10 games under 500 on the road. The Rockies, Cubs, A's, and Royals are the four teams with fewer road wins this season than the battle-tested, resilient, veteran club, the Philadelphia Phillies. Like, how do you figure that? You know, I could go for a young team, an inexperienced team, team that hasn't been through it, doesn't know how to travel, doesn't know how to deal with being out on the road, doing the wrong things. There's a lot of different things that can contribute to a team's inability to perform well on the road. A veteran team that had just gone through a playoff run, though, that has this type of experience and talent to be 11 and 21 on the road. I mean, how the hell do you even figure that? I I just that's one especially that jumps out at me. I mean, I know it's hard to win baseball games on the road. We've seen a lot of bad teams be pretty good at home, be horrendous on the road. I, I cannot believe that they're this poor, though. Yeah, I I find it interesting. A couple of things that have been said lately and the one i thought that was really really um interesting ah maybe i'm reading into it a little bit but when trey turner said we have to figure out the difference you know what we need to do whether it's have fun or get to work or a little bit of both like find that balance what is he saying there like is that a suggestion that some guys aren't taking it seriously enough that some players are taking are too serious that, you know, the, the mix is the mix just off right now where, you know, some players are so balls to the wall, 100% and don't know how to have fun playing the game. And some guys maybe are too blase about it, which was the other quote, which was Kyle Schwarber, you know, mentioning that he doesn't feel that there blo- there, there's any blase. But he brought that up on his own. Like, that was his right. word. Like, nobody else used it. And so, like, a couple of those things. I, I, you know, I, sometimes athletes are just athletes, and they say things, and, you know, they're trying to, you know, they know what the questions are going to be, and they try to formulate answers, and the way words come out sometimes are just the way words come out sometimes. I don't ever really try and read too deep into what an athlete is, is saying. But when you hear messages that have certain buzzwords that you haven't heard before, then it starts to make you wonder what the conversations are that are going on in that clubhouse. 
Like, what do they really believe? And well, so, like, I, think I, find, anytime, I find an interesting balance there. I think anytime players start getting philosophical about clubhouse dynamics and motivation and attention to detail, and I think there's something that spurs that. You know, obviously they're being asked about it, but there's a lot of different ways to respond. And I'm not criticizing anybody for responding thoughtfully and being honest, but you can, you can shut that shit down right away and say, that's absolutely not it. That's not it. But you're starting to hear some players talk about what's happening and what it isn't and what it is and what it could be. And it does lead you to believe you said it, is it the right mix? You know, I think a lot of times we look at it from a, a team perspective and we say, well, this team is complacent. The whole team is complacent or that this team is pressing. The whole team is pressing. These are individuals. And, you know, while one guy might be pressing more than he's ever pressed before in his life, there does that does not mean that, that all 26 guys are. So I do think that there's something about a chemistry. And one of the things that we talked so much about before the season, one of the reasons you kind of like the Phillies is because you saw that chemistry and you saw how it all – all of these different ingredients just kind of came together and it just took off like a rocket ship last year. And now you're starting to wonder, like, are we, are we witnessing the opposite where all of these different parts are, are coming together and they're not doing anything. There's no reaction. There's no physical reaction at all. It's just a, a bunch of different, different perspectives and different mentalities all sort of just bouncing around a clubhouse leading to, to nothing. And in a way, it almost feels like that right now. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, go I, ahead. No, I think you're. I think you're. You're again. You're. You're. You're right on with this because my experience will tell me that when you are listening to players talk and coaches talk every day. Like we do. I mean, that's we're, it's why we're down there at games. It's why we watch every game. It's why we have this podcast, right? Because that's that's what we're tasked to do. You can kind of pick up on changes in attitude, changes in behavior, changes in just vibe, okay? And we try to portray that in what we write and what we, what we say. And, of course, you know, fans can take it as they want. They can buy in 100% to what we're telling them. They can sit there and tell tell us that we're idiots and we're nuts and we're wrong and that they see it completely different. I get it. That's the fan's perspective. But when, you, but from my experience in doing that and, and being able to read people, which is, which is, I think, one of my strengths, right? If I had to weigh, weigh my strengths and weaknesses in my career, I think one of my strengths is that I'm able to kind of understand where things are coming from when, when athletes speak to me or coaches speak to me or speak in general. I, I see something different and I feel something different. That's not to say that this clubhouse can't be like it was a year ago or like it was in spring training where there was a lot of togetherness and a lot of buy-in and a lot of – like that is, that is tangible and it's, and, and it's obvious. You can see it when it's there. And you, and you see these players and you believe that these players can be that. But right now, it's I don't think it's there. And I think that's where why I point out what those guys say, because I think this is not that they doubt themselves or doubt that it can exist. It's just letting everybody know that right now it's not the way it is in that clubhouse, even though it needs to be. And that's that's a, to me, that's an interesting way of looking at it and saying they're looking at it from a, from that perspective as well, that there's that there's maybe a little bit of. Not a bad mix, but a, just a, a mix that's not right right now. And they got to figure out how to get that right first while they're trying to come out of their offensive struggle. That's why I say they're in a dark place. We pay a lot of attention to how players respond to media, how players respond to fans, especially when things aren't going well. This is a storyline we've seen numerous times in this city. Uh, How is Nick Castellanos dealing with the booze during his first season with the Phillies? It's been such a disappointment. Can he deal with it? Will he deal with it? We know that storyline. And we know that some players are better equipped to deal with it than others. I have a question for you. You're Mm. in that clubhouse right now. And you see Kyle Schwarber hitting 160, going through what he's going through. A guy that's supposed to be a leader. Who is a leader? I'm not questioning that. Uh, 
you see Trey Turner, who has been utterly dismal in every capacity, he cannot hit. His bats are terrible. He's been brutal in the field, underwhelming in every sense of the word. Anybody in that clubhouse kind of sitting there going, come on, guys. What the hell are you doing? Is there anybody picking up their phone after a game, sending a text message to a buddy? Buddy says, yo, what the hell is happening with you guys? He says, yeah, I mean, fucking Schwarber can't make contact. He had 10 hits last month. Uh, Trey Turner, we paid this dude $300 million. He hasn't done shit. Is, is there any of that? That happened? I'm not saying for you to peg it down on this team. Does that happen? Or does everyone look at it and say, Kyle is Kyle, is Kyle, man. Like, we know he's going to get it going. I still believe he's going to get it going. I know that Trey Turner is one of the best 30 players in Major League Baseball. I know why we gave him that deal. It's just a matter of time. Like, Trey, Trey's going to cook eventually. It, like, what, what's happening in there right now? Does it happen, Bob? Yes, it happens. But I don't think it happens this quickly. I don't think it goes that rotten this quick. I don't um, either. I don't either. No, no. I mean, I think that, look, I've been around bad hockey team for a long time, right? And yes, it eventually gets to that point where there is that, you know, internal whispering where people just don't like each other, don't like playing with each other. And it just, it, it's a malaise that needs to change. It's like, like that was the whole thing when, when they brought in the new coach last year and he did, did the whole thing about, you know, creating a standard and setting, putting, giving these guys structure that they didn't have. So those things can happen in pro sports, of course. You're not, and, and it's no different than you know, uh, working stiffs like us. There's always going to be people that you work with that maybe you don't agree with how they work or they don't work the same way you do, right? Um, but you work with them anyway because that's what you're paid to do. So those things Name happen. names. What's that? Name names. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, those things happen. Um, but I don't think you go from being – one of the tightest clubhouses in recent memory in, in really any sport to having a 55 game struggle at the start of the season and suddenly say that it's all rotten at the core. Like right. that's, I don't, I don't see that. I mean, well, do I think that there are conversations? Sure. But I don't think anybody's killing their teammate at this point, even if they are struggling, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I bring this up more more so to just put a, a fresh twist on the on the observation, like a, a fresh twist on on trying to figure out what's going on. Like, what I don't want to do is hop on here and do uh, what every other show right now or you know every other radio show is doing, which is like, do you fire Rob Thompson to give the team a spark like last year? You know, I don't. So I'm trying to look at different angles as to what might be going on. I agree with you. I, I don't think that's happening here. Uh, I don't think there's any reason to believe that's happening here. Uh, I do wonder, though, when it relates back to the manager, because I know a lot of fans are starting to get impatient, and I get it, because this is a team that is not only underachieving, but they are not particularly interesting team to watch. There's, it, it is a painful, painful watch right now, just from a pure entertainment standpoint. Uh, you, you basically are – more often than not, frustrated watching this team play baseball one through nine on a night-in, night-out basis. So I don't think it happens between the players, but does it happen between the players and the coaches? Like, is that the first, is that the first thing to fracture? Like, do you go through an entire season and you say, like, this was just a, a year where you write it off? And you, you run it back next year with the same dynamics in terms of coaching staff, if it doesn't get better, like, or do you think, I guess what I'm ultimately asking you, and I apologize, it's kind of a roundabout way, but how much goodwill does last year buy this group this year? And I don't mean well, like the group as in the players, but as in the coaching staff, like, yeah. do you trust the process right now? Do you trust Rob's? everything's fine. We just got to get healthy. It's okay. Or, you know, does there come a time where like, dude, man, like you got to give me a little bit more than that. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I think it's aggravating that we get the, the rosy picture at all times from, from the manager. Um, but I think I wrote this a little last week sometime. I, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's, what's happening, yeah. what's happening behind, behind closed doors. Right. I, I think that there's, far more meat on the bone than what we are given 
an opportunity to, to chew on, right? Um, so I do think that they get a little bit more time. I, 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 when I say a little bit, I, I think they get the year for sure. No, um, but at the same time, let's, let's remember, it's not like they went out and gave Rob Thompson a five-year deal because he got him to the World Series last year. He signed for, two, what, two years, right? I mean, so he would be going into next season. Let's just – let's say that this never turns around and it ends up being the disaster that it is and they don't make the playoffs and they finish under 500 or whatever. He's going into next year <clears throat> on the last year of a deal. Right. So he becomes a lame duck in a lot of ways. And so then it becomes get this thing fixed, get it right, or else you're not going to be out – you're going to be out of a job. Um, so I do think that there's, there's rope, but not as much as maybe somebody with a longer deal yeah. would have. Yeah. And I, I, I agree. And I, I hear you. Oh, I think what I'm more interested in is, is the message because one of the storylines that got pumped up so hard last year was that Rob came in and he had a steady hand and he had a patient approach and that really paid dividends with that particular team. And now I agree. I'm sure there are things that are happening behind the scenes that we don't hear about, that we don't see, that aren't conveyed to the public, aren't conveyed to the fans. But if that becomes your MO as a manager, like that's my thing. I, I don't I don't waver in the in the face of adversity. And I have the steady hand. And this is what works so well for that team. You bring back that team the next year. You have your approach that you're known for. I think it's an interesting balance as a manager because you say, okay, I want to be genuine. I want to be who I am, but it's not working now. So what do I do? And am I going to come across as disingenuous if I kind of, if I kind of steer from my normal personality, like my normal, my normal approach, you know, like I, I think that that's what's so weird about this because it looks like this team needs a kick in the ass, but Rob Thompson isn't known as the, kicking the ass guy so is he capable of delivering that kick in the ass or does do they just simply need more time and it's all good and i I know that he's doing i agree with you that those things are probably happening behind the scenes but like let's be honest here like this dude's not larry boa either you know and i'm not saying he should be by any means like no offense to larry but like i think that that's what if you're rob thompson like your your head's hitting the pillow at night and you've got to be like what the what the fuck do I do to fix this? Yeah, I think Bob would, I think his approach is probably, you know, a little bit more of a hybrid, right? So um, when he feels like he needs to send a message rather than just do it and have this, you know, this big thing play out through the media that uh, why is this happening? Or, oh my God, this change just happened. And, you know, like if you, I, I'll take you back to the whole Schwarber thing. Should he hit lead off? And he was saying up until the day that he made the change that, you know, he believed that Kyle's good leadoff hitter and belongs in that spot. Look what he did last year and all those things. He never once suggested that he was thinking of making the change. And then all of a sudden, even though we were asking questions about it, he made the change. So obviously he had been thinking about it. Obviously there had been a lot of discussions internally about it. And he probably takes it from the perspective of, He sits down with the player, in that instance, Kyle Schwarber, and has a long conversation with him and says, look, it's just not good enough what's happening where you are. We need to make a change there. We need you to be okay with it and accept it. You're still going to be in the lineup. You're still going to be a big part of the team, just not where we have had you and not in a place that you feel most comfortable. And we need you to to hop on board and, and be with us on this. And I think that that is kind of the approach where it's like, look, you may not be happy about it, but you respect the guy for being transparent and honest and forthright and explaining why they're making certain decisions. And, you know, and that's today's athlete. Like they want that kind of thing. It's not like back in a day where a manager would walk into a room, flip over a table and then bench three guys and not give them a reason why he's doing it, forcing them to figure it out on their own. Today's athlete wants a reason. They want an explanation. And I think that those things are happening when changes are made. The big question that we can ask is, are changes happening fast enough? Are the, are the right changes happening? Are there things that he could have done at this point? Like you and I have gone back and forth on, on text message, Trey Turner should have been moved out of the two hole by now. Yeah. And last week we said on this program, you know, you asked and I said, you know, look, I, I agree you should have been out, but 
I, I was willing to give him through the Mets series just to see if yeah. he can fix, find it, right? Well, he didn't. So now it has to happen. Like I will be, I will be up. I, I will, I will be disappointed in the manager today if Trey Turner's still hitting two. So let's let's talk about that a little bit because here we are. He hits the home run against the Diamondbacks, saves the game. They don't get swept. This is going to be the moment that turns around Trey Turner. How many times have we heard that? So all he does is he goes down to Atlanta. And he goes to New York in his last seven games. So this is a big road trip, a show-me road trip for the Phillies against two division rivals who whooped them last year in the regular season, went over 100 games. Phillies aren't even close. It's time to show that you're here. This team's different. All those statements, all the things that we want to latch on as talking points. Trey Turner on that road trip hit 138. He was four for 29. He had one walk. He slugged 207. Of 21 qualified shortstops this season, Turner is 18th in OPS at 648. He has been dismal. And think about it, and I want you to think about it this way. We've had this conversation for weeks now, but think about what we were saying in the middle of last week during that homestand about how bad it's been. And then he's worse. He gets worse. And this guy's still hitting two? I mean, it just... I, I am... I am smart enough to know that you cannot write off players after a third of a season. And I'm smart enough to know that he has a, a long established track record of being one of the best players in baseball. And do I think it's more likely that he at some point this season looks more like that guy than the guy that he's been to this point? I do, but I'm almost just deferring to conventional wisdom in saying that. And for that reason right now, I cannot have this guy hit in front of Bryce Harper. I cannot take as bad as a lot of these guys have been. I cannot take a player like Trey Turner right now, given how bad he's been and hit him in front of Bryce Harper. I have to break them up. So if you want to leave Trey Turner two, then you got to get Bryce Harper out of three. Like you cannot pair those two up anymore. It's not working. It has not worked. It's time. And really, if we're being honest, and you're the guy that's kind of been out ahead of this, you talk about what to do with the Phillies lineup because nobody's hitting. And, like, as a quick aside, here you go, Kyle Schwarber hitting 160. You know what he was on that road trip? Two for 23. He had 087. You know what JT Real Muto did on that road trip? He was two for 20. He hit 100. So there, there are prominent players not doing anything. But you you have to change it. Like I, I don't I don't care that you don't have a, a, a likely solution here. I don't care that there's not a, a glaringly obvious player that you can flip into the top of the order. You gotta change it. You just gotta change it, man. This comes this comes down to my my one criticism that I think that is longstanding of 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 players, managers, players, coaches. I get the benefit. I understand why they work. I understand that letting players be, be themselves a lot of times can result in success where you're not, you know, beating them over the heads constantly and just let them be themselves. But when things are going bad, you can't because the players, players are players and, 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 that's something an old hockey coach used to say all the time that, that I know. And he said, players are players. He says, ultimately, you have, to, you have to find a way to guide them. And if it's not working, you're right. It has to, be, it has to just be changed for change's sake because that's, that's what needs to happen. The Phillies have, don't have an answer, I don't think, on the current roster that fixes this other than, again – moving Bryce Harper. And that's what I was circling to. I don't like the fact that Bryce Harper can decide which game he takes off. The Sunday night game against Atlanta or the first game against the Mets. I don't like that he's given the choice. I understand why he's given the choice, but I don't like it. To me, it's you tell him yeah. when he's taking his day off. Which is also me saying, I don't like the fact that Bryce Harper dictates that he always bats third. 
if you need him to move out of that spot, which they did last year, he batted fourth when he came back at the end of the year and in the playoffs, he, he was the cleanup hitter, right? So there were they, there was a change, but right now he's you're, he's obviously your best player, but the guys in front of him really aren't doing their job. Stott's been better. And I know you don't want to load up lefties and with Bohm on the on the IL and, and the three right and you know and the other two right handers that you would potentially put in the two hole, they're just not hitting. So what the hell are you gonna do? I think you have to make a change again, even if it's only for this weekend. And then come Monday, you go back to what you were doing before. But you have to give them something different. And it has to be Bryce, we need to move you from three. But sorry, I know you like hitting third. We'll get you back there, but you need to help us out for a few days, three, you know, three games, four games, a week, whatever it is. You gotta, you gotta lead off, or you gotta bat second, or whatever, it, whatever it is. You've got to just change what that lineup looks like, because right now, it can't, it cannot stay what it is, for the sole reason, Bob, that they cannot have it be. The, the same thing going out there night after night for other teams to attack it the same way. Yeah, give give the opponent a different look. Give yourself yeah. a different feel. Like, why would anybody be married to anything remotely resembling this current construction of the lineup given what the results have been? If I'm a player, I think I'm going in saying like, hey, let's figure it out. Let's try something different. I know there is a to an extent where there's a stay the course, and it's not like this team's going through one bad week or two bad weeks. It's been – Two bad months now. So I think I would have a little bit more willingness to flip things around and say, all right, let's experiment here. And I do want to go back to one thing that you said, and I agree with you. I don't think that that choice should be presented uh, unless the player says, like, listen, I don't I don't feel well. I need an extra day. So I would prefer this. Like, that's fine. But you look at what happened the other night and. We get on this show, and I know that we tend to, uh, people that are writers, people that talk about teams, fans, we tend to assign more importance to some of these games and some of these series than the players and the teams themselves do. I, I readily acknowledge that. But we're talking about this Mets series as being pretty important. You've played poorly. You have an opportunity to take advantage of a team here that hasn't been that good themselves, a team that you're going to be battling with probably for one of those wild card spots. And you've already sort of dropped the ball against those teams already to this point. This team beat the hell out of you last year. There, there's something to this series. You know, there's a little bit more juice to this series, whether or not they want to admit it. And what do you get when the lineups released on Tuesday afternoon, you get Bryce Harper on the bench. And you go, like, what kind of message does that send to your fan base? Like, what kind of message does that send, I think, even to within that team? Even if you in, are, are in that clubhouse and you know why or, hey, yeah, Bryce played Sunday night. He hasn't had a day off. We want to give him two days back to back. Medically, it makes sense. We have research. Okay, fine. That's all great and fine and well. But here you are. It's this massive series. And this guy's not in a lineup in the opener. And it was just kind of like, is that really, like, is that really the, the approach, the mentality that you want to send? And I get it. Like, oh, well, Kyle Schwarber is you, you if about the defense and ballparks and it actually is advantageous because now he doesn't have to run around in a bigger outfield. I don't want to hear that, man. Like, I don't want to hear any of that. Sunday night, if, if there really was either or, Sunday night, you're throwing – Dylan Covey against Spencer Strider. You winning that game? No, you're not winning that game. Like, let's be real. So Bryce Harper doesn't need to play Sunday night. Like, he's, he doesn't need to play Sunday night. Sunday, Monday, off, back in the lineup Tuesday. Let's go get the Mets. It, like, it, I do not, I, like, what, or, was it was it about Sunday night baseball, the, the national spotlight of Sunday night baseball? Nobody even fucking watches Sunday night baseball. Nobody cares. America no. does not care about Sunday night baseball. If I'm if I'm getting in Bryce Harper's head, and I'm, I'm this is again speculative. No one's told me this, but I'm trying to understand his rationale for choosing to play Sunday versus playing Tuesday. You probably look at it and says, "Hey, we're at a pitching disadvantage in this game, so it's probably better for me to stay in the lineup and give us a chance to, you know, maybe pull it out." as opposed to going up against a guy like Kodai Senga, who's been wild as hell, 
the Mets don't have great bullpen. So if we have a good approach in that game and I'm on the bench, like maybe we can, you know, we should still be able, we have a better chance of winning without me against the Mets than we do against the Braves. I think that's probably his rationale. But if you're the Phillies, you look at it and say, after you win Saturday, and again, this is where it's, we make these lineups a week in advance and that, I, I don't have, I don't put that, I don't understand that in my head either, right? Like I just don't that you schedule out your lineups for a week. You may have a, an idea or thought of what you want to do, but you have to be willing to adapt and change it as the week goes along or as things happen. But once you win Saturday night and you realize we've won two out of three against the Braves, now you're playing with house money. We, we did what we were wanted to do, minimum split. Hey, if we get the third, third win, that's gravy. That's the, that's the cherry on top of this Sunday, right? So let's, let's make Sunday the day that we're giving Bryce off because we'll still feel good about going two and two for the weekend in Atlanta, even without Bryce. And then we start fresh with the Mets. They took the complete wrong approach. They let the player dictate because he thinks he's, he's helping the team more by being in the lineup against a better pitcher and it ultimately hurts the team because his decision was made, made from pure, adrenaline and and I want to be the guy to be the, to help the team I want to be a hero in a way and not really from let me t- step back a thousand feet and look at this you know uh from fr- from that view and say it's probably better for me to play against the Mets than the Braves because he's not a, he's not able to do you that know what I, I often think about like I think about uh and I guess I've been more sensitive to this in recent years you go down there and you you cover a team and you develop some relationships even and and you think about if if you work for the Phillies or you're a player or a coach or you're listening to this show and you're listening to us have this conversation you're like come on guys like it's not that big of a deal like it's it's one game at the end of May who really cares like do you really need to dive into the psychology of that particular decision and I would say fair point fair criticism But when you are one of the worst offenses in Major League Baseball, you have one of the worst starting rotations in Major League Baseball, you've been completely underwhelming, arguably are the most disappointing team in the league. I'm sorry, but you're going to open yourself to nitpicking and, you know, micromanaging isn't the right word, but I'm going to pick apart every little decision now because the things that should have been going well aren't and you leave the door open to these types of criticisms. Yeah, and Bob, you, look at, you can say it's nitpicky if the the flow of the season is going as you like you said, like it's going as you expected, right? Then yeah, okay, it could be you could sit there and it's it's nitpicky, but when you have consistent problems and you are looking for solutions, these are things that you have to consider. And I'm sure, I mean, look, they, they have, we know that they have these discussions internally. So if they're having these discussions internally, us having them externally doesn't matter. Like, I mean, it's the same thing, right? It, it doesn't, yeah, they can say we're being nitpicky, but guess what? You're talking about it too. You just don't like the fact that we're talking about it publicly. That's why you're going to say, oh, it's nitpicky. But why is this any different than being three games out of a playoff spot in September, and deciding what you have to do. Because right now you're three games out of three and a half, whatever it is, three and a half games out of a playoff spot. Let's say it's the same thing in September. Is it nitpicky then? Right? I mean, I, I, does the, the, that, that's why I don't understand why the time of year should tell you that we're being, we're overanalyzing. Or being- I'm tired of hearing that. I, it's one of the things yeah. I actually have written down here. Like, I, I'm sorry. I, I know that people like to talk about the calendar and the time of year to sound like, to sound smart. You do not have the right to criticize or comment or observe anything in a negative fashion because it's May, because it's April, because it's June. I'm so tired of hearing that. I'm so tired of people saying, well, last year they did this, or the last three National League champions got off to slow starts. As if because, and I've said this numerous times, because the thing that is unlikely to happen happened, and it's actually happened a couple consecutive times now, that we should just feel good. Like, Right now, if you feel good about the Phillies, it's because of what happened last year. Like you're, you're relying on something that is not current. You're relying on something that is not even tangible anymore. So I don't want to hear that. 
and, and like I, I feel like anytime that that I see people, and it's not like it's it's not about me, like nobody's saying it to me, but I see people getting frustrated with the manager. I see people getting frustrated with Trey Turner, with Kyle Schwarber, with this team in general. And you know, a lot of people are quick to jump into like the replies and say, It's June, chill out, bro. You know, t- talk to me fourth of July, talk to me in September. And I'm like, then what are we even doing? Then why are we even watching these games if they don't matter? Like these people that, that do this, like look at the calendar. It's not the second week of April. It's June. It matters now. We're in it. Yeah, and I agree with you. Although I mean, the, where, where I where I pl- kind of hedge the fence a little bit is, and I think you, and I'm, what I'm going to say here, I know you agree with. So it's not like it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm enlightening the world here with what I'm about to say. <laughs> but but – but, you know, baseball, maybe more so than any sport, does have that uh, – there's a lot of time in the season. So, yeah, you know, it's possible to, you know, fig- fix it over the course of the next two months. And if they're still doing this in August, well, then forget it. You're done at that point, you know, like, yeah, oh, well, all right, bad year. Um, they, they blew it. And, and that's fine, Right. You can you can believe you can still believe. Look, we still believe this is a playoff team. As bad as they've been, we still believe that this is a playoff team. That doesn't mean that in the moment you you can't sit there and say, "Well, geez, if they would just do, if they could just fix this now, maybe you don't have to worry about that anxiety two months from now." Maybe yeah, it's, it's a lot possible to actually. I, I know this is a crazy thought, but it is possible to play consistently good baseball from the beginning of a season. Through the end of the season. Now you're going to have your peaks and valleys, season ebbs and flows, but you don't always have to dig yourself out of a two month hole. <laughs> you know, like it's like, I know it's a foreign concept, this idea that you can actually enjoy something for multiple months, but you know, th- this does not have to be the path. And it's very disappointing to me that this is the path. Uh, it, that if they get to where they want to go again, that this is the path that they had to follow. I, I just, I feel like that they should be better than this. I feel like that they are, they should be over this. I think they should have cleared this hurdle of, you know, not being able to get it together early in the season. I I'm surprised and I'm a little bit just disappointed that this is what we're doing. I, I really am. No, I, 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 you were right to be, to be that way. Um, and we didn't even get into the pitching. Well, and I, I know, and like we're, we were talking ahead of this, we're like, we'll be a little bit shorter today because I know that you're remote. But I, I want to just hit on one more thing here, uh, and if you have a couple more things, fine. I, I've got the time today, and you know, I uh, yesterday in this finale, Taiwan Walker. So after 12 starts, he has a five six five ERA, and we've been a little bit more bullish on him recently. You know, coming into that start yesterday, I'd said four out of his last five starts. He removed the the blow up against the Giants. He's actually been pretty encouraging. He's given them a little bit more length. He gutted through that start against the Braves. And yesterday, it's not like he was. A, it's not like he blew up. It's not like he left the Phillies incapable of winning that game. But you see the diminished velocity. He only goes four innings. And then after the game, you're expecting them to come out and say, he's got forearm tightness. He felt something. We're probably going to have to IL him. And then instead, all you hear is, well, yeah, he's actually all right. You know, he just wasn't feeling himself today. Has there been a pitcher? Like, has there been a – I cannot remember a player in recent memory that that has had this type of – not even just turbulent performance, but just this, what do you mean he's okay? If he's okay, then how the hell did he last four innings yesterday? Like, I, this is where I feel like I'm starting to take crazy pills. Like, is there no, like, are we not, like, what are we doing? Like, what do you make well, of that? What do you make of it? Because I, 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 I feel I like I'm turning into a, a, a ranting idiot here. No, I, I was really annoyed by yesterday, post-game yesterday, because – Here's a guy, like you said, who had been pitching well, who comes into this game and his velocity is way the hell down. And he gets hit around a little bit and has to get pulled after four innings. And his response is, eh, morning game. My body just wasn't with me. Whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) You knew. You knew. Just look at the calendar. You know when you're pitching, right? 
you look at that and you see, oh, I have a 105 start time. Is my is I have a start coming up? It's 105. So you get yourself right body wise, so that it's ready to go for a one o'clock game. Not this. Oh, I, I just wasn't ready for a, a morning morning routine. What? What are you saying? That's mm-hmm. to me. That's that's damning. That's like I I just didn't prepare myself because yeah yeah. If I had if I had six more hours, I'd have been fine. But yeah, you know, who knows? Maybe it was a rough night the night before. He's back in New York, you know, catching up with some old friends. Who knows? Whatever. I'm just spitballing here, right? But that that's concerning to me, Bob. Like that can't be a reason to not have to be four miles off on your fastball or and, and to you know not say yeah, uh, it just was one of those days. I just didn't feel good. Like no, that's not an excuse. And yeah, again, and this also. Time, this and also, what I was I mean, saying earlier about the, you know, have fun or or, or 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 you know, work at what you need to work on, right? I mean, maybe maybe Taiwan Walker's having too much fun. Who knows? Right? Like, you I, I can't don't have that be a reason. I don't know, but I mean, I also go back and look. He pitched against the Cubs in the daytime, same time, one thirty-five start was good. A couple starts prior to that, he pitched against the Red Sox. He was good in a day game. Like, I don't want to hear anything about time of day related to performance and. You know, again, through 12 starts, he's averaging less than five innings pitch per start. And six of the 12 starts, he's failed to complete five innings. And we don't need to talk about expectations and the contract that they handed him or any of that. It's just it's just very disappointing. And it almost reminds me of and one of one of my flaws is like I only can quote like four movies in the history of of the world. But and one of them is Major League and Major League Two is actually like one of the others. It just reminds me of like Major League Two, like Rick Vaughn comes out back like back to spring training. The first day he throws like eight pitches and he's like, all right, I'm good. That's enough. Like and doesn't even blink about it. Like, what do you mean he's OK? Oh, he's OK. He just he didn't have his stuff today. Like, I just don't get it. I do. I do not understand it. I don't know if that's one of those things where the manager doesn't want to, you know, bury the player and privately he's in his office going like, what, are you kidding me? Like, I, I will allow for all of these. I, I will allow for the fact that the public explanation might have been di- different than the, the private interpretation or reaction. But my God, man, like. It's just like another one of these things where you consider what's happened this past week and then you hear that and you're like, what are what are we doing? Um, and, you know, you, you said we didn't even really get into the pitching. And I don't know. I, I don't know, man. Uh, we're, we're over an hour. I, I feel like that this has gotten off the rails. It's just becoming like a, a therapy session. But, you know, Aaron Nola, do you want to give me – we all know that you are the number one Aaron Nola supporter. Can you, can you give me your thoughts on his start on, on Wednesday night? The concern for me, Bob, when that start was he, he, got his, he had his velocity up back yeah. in 95 – and still gave up four runs in the game. And when you look at it, you say you gave up four hits, three singles, and a home run. Well, what, well, what wrong? How do you? How, I mean, geez, I mean, you only got four hits, three walks. It's it. He's getting behind batters. Yeah. Like, it, it, I don't know how you go from one start where your velocity is down and you can't really differentiate between the fastball and the changeup. So it really makes the changeup irrelevant and ineffective um and but you still battle and you still you know find good decent locations and try and try and work your way through a game to then getting back to what you normally throw and now you can't find locate now you can't locate anything right and and i think that he's got to get away from throwing that cutter i think that that cutter is killing him um this year especially he's just not that, that's the one he throws the home run ball to, to Kana. That that pitch was dead awful. Uh, you know the, the 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 two the two two out single that scores two runs by Kana. I mean that's a good pitch. I think. I mean it was ninety five and it was up out of the strike zone, above the strike zone, and Kana still was able to get a flat bat on it and, and get a hit. But the problem isn't that particular at bat. It's the fact that he walked two guys beforehand. And I was most upset with his two, the two at bats by Daniel Vogelbach, which he didn't even throw a strike to this guy. Guys, what, what's he hitting? 210, 220? I mean, he's not a good hitter. Right. Yeah, he can, he's got some, he's Kyle Schwarber light, is what he is. Although light is a 
wrong word to use, I think, when you're talking about Vogelbach. But, um, I mean, that's you – know, what, what are you – why are you pitching him the way you're pitching? Just put, put the ball – throw a strike, man. Throw a couple strikes. You've got behind hitters. It, it's like I don't know where – every start seems to be different with Aaron Nola. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's and the I thing. There's no pattern to it. There's no. Yeah. Well, all right. I see what's building here. I see what he's working on. I see the progression. I or or I see why it's going wrong. Even it's it, you literally at this point have no idea what you're getting from a pitcher who, if nothing else, over the years. I mean, and there's been a lot else, and a lot of it's good. But you always say like you, you kind of knew what you're getting with Aaron Nola. You know, yeah. obviously he'd have those starts where he would be uh, phenomenal and he would have his occasional blowups. But m- more often than not, you'd say, I can expect a competitive start tonight. And not even to say that he was horrible the other night. I don't want to over-exaggerate what it was, but there's just no consistency. There's there's no progression to it. It's it's truly all over the place, time to time. Yeah. Nothing and, correlates. Yeah, and look, and I, the way I wrote it the other day, and I stand by this, is He's he's not getting throttled in games. He's pitching he, when he gives up runs. He then seems to rebound okay, has good innings, keeps the team in the game. But that's what you things that you say about a number four star. What I thought Aaron Nola this season has been what I thought Taiwan Walker was going to be. Yes, yes, that's fair. Yeah. That's a hundred percent. You you can't when you're Aaron Nola, you can't be that. That's all. And, and good observation on the cutter. And I don't know if you happen to look this up, but uh, opponents this season are hitting 306 against his, yeah. his cutter. They're slugging 667 against it. It's awful. I mean, and, awful. and the performance against the sinker has not been as good. I mean, like, like for, for comparison here, uh, opponents hit 178 against his sinker last season, 259 this season. They're slugging 90 point, uh, percentage points higher. So teams are doing more damage against the sinker too, but the cutter has been by far – the, the the pitch that he's get, just getting look it's his fourth pitch on. it's his fourth pitch why is he relying on it in any I mean like I would just I would go back to three pitches throw the sinker throw the curveball throw the changeup yeah he's got that little two seam I guess that he can kind of you could kind of call that the the, the the alternate version of the sinker um, but but yeah I would I would abandon the cutter I would completely abandon it and the reasoning that the numbers are up against the sinker is because of velocity that's the velocity problem yeah. Right, I mean, I mean he's throwing that cutter. Away. He's throwing that cutter almost as often as he's thrown his changeup this season, and he's got a good changeup. Yeah, and I get again, I get it because if you don't have the fastball velocity where you want it, yeah, you're going to shy the, away from the changeup. Then yeah. you're going to shy away from the changeup. So you you want a third pitch that you can throw, and so he's throwing the cutter, but it's not a good pitch. So I would I would work on, well, work on. I would suggest throwing more fastballs, get that velocity back to where it needs to be and cut down on throwing the cutter. I, I think then you, you ha- you're you throwing your three best pitches and then and, and I think maybe you'll get, you know, back closer to what you'd been before. But the cutter just doesn't work for me. And it doesn't work for him either. All right. Well, I think, I think we got it. You have a one last thing for me? Of course I do. And I think I'm going to surprise you with this one, Bob. Because I think my take on it is going to surprise you and probably surprise everybody else. I'm sure you saw Scherzer's comments after the game against the Phillies about the strict clock oversight and the frustration of it. And he's frustrated and the umpires are frustrated and everything else. And it's terrible. And, you know, what's baseball doing? I want to just say, shut up, Max Scherzer. I, I swear to God, because, look, you know I'm not a huge fan of, of the new rules. I think there are things that are being completely overlooked and not talked about. I, I'm not going to say overlooked, overlooked publicly. I, I'm certain that they're being identified internally. I mean, things like, as ba- we've talked about how bad umpires are calling balls and strikes and why that is, because they're, they have to concentrate on the – the clock now and, and all the pitching injuries. The pitching injuries are way the hell up this year. Um, it has to relate to the fact, well, part of it is they're all, everybody throws a hundred now. And so they're killing their arms. But the other part of it is, is that they have to do it with more rapidity, right? They're, they're, every, they're throwing a hundred miles an hour every 15 seconds now, right? So I, that's got to be part of the problem. Nobody's talking about those things. Instead, we're bitching about the fact that he can't get an eighth warm up pitch in time. Like, 
focus on the real issue and not the BS issues because the BS issues only make you sound like chicken little. Yeah. Like you're screaming, the sky is falling. And if you do that, people are going to tune you out. So if you really, Max Scherzer, want to effectuate change in the new rules, let's talk about what the real issues are and not make it all about crap that nobody wants to hear about. That's my take. Throw it to you on the same, same subject. I have nothing to add. I really don't. I, 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 I'm with you. I think that Max Scherzer probably looks at it and says, I am one of the most prominent figures in the game. Uh, if I complain, it might, as you said, effectuate change. Um, but while I applaud that initiative, um, it's, it's just not the right way, I don't think, to go about it. And I know he wanted to also make a, a point and say the umpires even know it. I mean, that was one of his, his biggest points was it's not just the players or the managers, but the umpires are saying, I hear you, man. It's insane, but – I believe MLB will get mad at me, I think is what he had said the home plate umpire had responded with yesterday. And and maybe he thought that was an opportunity to, to roll that into the conversation, but I, I just don't know. I think that I think they are going to tweak this thing. I think that there are going to be changes made at some point. I don't know if they're going to be sweeping changes, but there might be some tinkering. I think that that's probably what he did there. He probably looked at it and said, this is an opportunity for me to voice this out. Um, I, I'm fed up with it, but I agree. Instead of making a valid point or doing it in a way that you kind of sit there and listen to it and say, hmm, yeah, you're right. It's just just shut up and move on. You know, and yeah, I think it definitely had that vibe about it. It, it, it comes across it comes across as self-serving. Yeah. The way he did it. Yeah. I didn't and get not, my eighth warm-up pitch. What like Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. and not like here's what we can do to help baseball. Yeah. Yeah. And that's if, if he's if he's if he continues to be a squeaky wheel from the perspective of this is harming baseball and here's why and here's how and really kind of show it. Yeah. Then great. Then talk all you want, Max. Say it. Get it out there. Get it out into the world. Let people hear it and know it. But don't make it about yourself. When you make it about yourself, you you turn people off in general just for being that kind of guy. But then, in, but then secondarily, anything else you say after that, people are going to just be like, oh, there's Max Scherzer are going off again and not really putting into context if you say something that's valid. So just f- pick your arguments and, and know what arguments to make and when to make them. I think you're better off than just bitching about the fact that you only got seven warm-up pitches instead of eight. Ah, well, the Phillies <laughs> travel to... Washington to complete what has just been a, an epic, legendary, really exciting road trip. Uh, and, you know, do yourself a favor. Look at the probable pitching matchups in this and tell me how you how good you feel about the Phillies getting back on track this weekend against the Washington team that they're one game better than currently. Uh, you hope for the rebound. We'll see if it happens. We will be back on Monday to talk about whatever it is that does happen. Uh, hopefully there's a, a little bit more sunshine to kind of uh, roll through here. But I'm not holding my breath right now, Anthony, so <laughs> we'll see. Uh, thank you for listening. You can follow us on YouTube. Check us out there. Uh, be sure to uh, also subscribe and follow along wherever you get your podcasts. And until next time, uh, for Anthony Sanfilippo, I'm Bob Wankel. Thanks for listening to Crossed Up.